One question I hear a lot when it comes to talking about curling strategy, especially among club level skips, is what should I do if my team can't hit? This even came up last week when talking about when the appropriate times to throw through were in my last video. Obviously, world-class teams play different than everyone else because of how consistently they can make hits. And even competitive teams will play different than, say, a typical club team, based on their hit percentage. So let's talk about what we should do differently when our team struggles to hit or we feel like it can't hit at all. First of all, it's important to think about what we mean when we say, my team can't hit. Does that mean your team has a tendency to throw a low percentage on hits? Isn't very precise? Does it mean that they miss the majority of their hits, even flashing open takeouts in the middle of the ice? Very rarely, if ever, does it mean they can't hit at all, at any weight, at any point in the game. Now, that may sometimes be the case when you're playing with very new or very casual curlers, especially on a casual league night. And in those cases, my advice is just don't worry about it. Call shots that your team can make, make sure everyone's having a good time, and don't worry too much about strategy. It doesn't mean you can't try to win, but really, focus on making sure that your teammates are throwing shots they're enjoying, and work with those shots as best you can to win the game. But when we talk about every other scenario, from being at a bond spiel to being in a more competitive league night, or even into more serious competitive play, we can still make adjustments to our strategy based on how good or how bad our team is at making hits. The key thing is that we want to make adjustments to our strategy, not overreactions. Think of curling strategy as a continuum, from an extremely aggressive style that throws tons of guards and never hits at all and isn't worried about playing defense in any situation, to an extremely conservative strategy that we're throwing through, hitting everything in sight and not worrying about how many points we're scoring. There's a lot of room for adjustment between those two extremes and you want to be moving on that line, not jumping from one extreme to the other. For instance, if your team is not good at hitting, you will want to play a more aggressive strategy. That means when it's close and early in the game, you'll definitely want to be throwing guards and trying to draw around them, even in situations where a more conservative team might choose to throw a hit. For instance, let's say the team without hammer throws one top four in the first end of the game. A conservative team, or even maybe even an average middle of the road strategy team, might be tempted to just hit that be willing to play for a blank or a simple end and just move on to the second end with whatever happens, taking away any really outlandish results from the first end. However, if your team doesn't hit well, it's perfectly okay to say right away, we're going to throw a corner guard. Right from the jump, you're going to start playing aggressively, try to set up a bigger end, and you'll find a way to deal with those middle rocks later in the end. Hopefully some of your later players are able to make some hits in the middle, even if your lead um, isn't too confident about throwing that hit. On the other hand, we're not going to go crazy with making adjustments in situations where conservative play is correct. For instance, let's say we're up four with Hammer in the final end of a game, and we see the non-Hammer team throw a rock to the top four. Well, no matter how bad your team is at hitting, there's really nothing better to do here than throw a hit at that rock. You might throw through, that's fine. But what would happen if you threw anything else but the hit? Well, you could try drawing into the house, but that rock doesn't do much to stop the steel team from setting up a center, and you're not looking to score anyway. All in all, that rock isn't a terrible rock for you for sure, but it could have some repercussions for you down the road, especially if it isn't thrown very well. Throw it to the back of the house, the non-hammer team is going to use it as backing later. Throw it around the T-line, and they might be able to tap it back, freeze to it, 
and deal with it later in the end. And should you come up short and throw a guard, now you've given the non-hammer team another place to hide, making their big steal just a little bit more likely. Instead of doing any of those things, just throw the hit. You might be surprised that your teammate makes it, especially if you let them throw at a weight that's comfortable for them. And if they happen to flash it, no harm done. That rock is still there. It's no different than if you threw through and you can deal with breaking down the steal attempt later in the end. Now, all that said, there are going to be times when you want to play defense, but not to an extreme extent. And because your team doesn't hit that well, you'll be looking for other ways to defend rather than just throwing hits. So let's look at a few ways you can play defense in curling without necessarily hitting rocks. One way to play defense without hitting is to make sure you always have multiple rocks in play, ideally separated in a way that makes it impossible for the other team to knock them both or all of them out at once. This will help you prevent giving up big ends as you cut down the scoring area and don't allow any pesky biters or rocks in the 12 foot to outcount you at the end of the end. For instance, imagine it's the first end of the game and you're playing yellow here without hammer. It's your vice's second rock and as you can see you're counting but red does have three rocks hanging around in the house. Now a team that was confident in hitting here probably would try to hit something out and limit the potential damage. Um, they might even hit the top rock on the bottom side of the house here to attempt to make a double and potentially really limit the scoring. But just because you're not comfortable hitting here doesn't mean you can't play defensively, at least to a certain extent. One fairly safe shot that you could try would be to throw a rock into the other side of the house, leaving you counting first and second. For instance, if you try to throw a rock down to the back red rock here on this side of the house, you may get a great freeze, but even if you don't, and say you come up both narrow of the rock and out in the open and not particularly near it, you now are sitting one and two with a rock that's not trivial to get rid of either. Red may come back and hit one of these rocks, say the more open one because it's the easier hit, and sit one, but now you're on skip rocks and perhaps your skip is comfortable hitting. And even if they're not, you can continue to try to do the same thing of putting two rocks in play. For certain, throwing a second rock into the house is not as safe a way to play defense as hitting the best red rock, sitting one two that way, and also limiting the damage at the same time. You could throw through, you could come up short and leave a guard, or you could even potentially leave a double that the red team makes here. Any of those situations immediately put you in a lot of trouble. However, throwing a second rock in the house is definitely preferable to simply guarding your corner rock. For one thing, you're not likely to steal here even if you do manage to guard your rock perfectly. The bigger problem, however, is that you're putting yourself in real danger of giving up a big end even if you make a good guard. Here's why. First, we can see that if we throw up a imperfect guard, there may be ways for red to hit out our yellow rock, even on the tougher side, pushing it over the top of that red and sitting five. If we go back and put that rock in a similar place and replace our guard a bit too close to the center line, the job gets even easier as they can throw a down weight hit, remove the yellow rock, and maybe roll a little to the outside, again sitting five. Now we're kind of committed to trying to draw around that yellow and hope that we can steal or somehow limit the damage by placing a rock perfectly in the house. But what happens even when we throw a pretty good guard? Well, for one, uh, the red team could just peel our guard, potentially even roll another one into the house, and force us to make another perfect guard. Depending on the ice conditions, they may even be able to throw a down weight hit to knock us out while the grok is guarded. There are also other ways to get rid of this yellow rock that the red team may try simply because the reward is so high for so little risk. 
If they get it wrong, they may give up one. But if they can get a run back double or an angle raise correct, they could score four here and immediately take a big lead early in the game that will be hard for you to come back from. There's a phrase about this that I like. The best guard is usually a second counter. This just means that when you have two rocks in play that can't be doubled, it's going to be very difficult for your opponent to take a huge end against you. Having one rock in play, even if it is fairly well guarded, is often not enough to stop a very nice shot from putting you in serious trouble. Another way to play defense when you don't want to hit is to take advantage of any backing that may be sitting in the rear of the house. This gives you a safer place to draw as those rocks in the back act sort of like guards. If you can throw a perfect freeze or something close to it, they may be essentially equivalent to guards, uh, making it take multiple rocks to get rid of your one rock that you've thrown in. In this fairly common club level example, you're once again playing the yellow rocks in a close game somewhere in the middle ends or early ends. It's one of your vice's rocks, let's say the vice's second rock, and red is sitting four. However, they do have some red rocks behind the T-line that could be used as backing. If you want to be aggressive and try to steal the end, you could use that yellow guard and draw around it to the top four or even touching the button. This would give you the potential for a steal. But what if you want to play defense? Well, there are hit and rolls, doubles, and other options available, but as we're talking about today, you don't really want to hit. In that case, the best thing to do is to draw down to those two rocks in the back of the forefoot. Doing this accomplishes a couple things. One, if your yellow rock comes anywhere near those red rocks, either a perfect freeze, maybe a up to a foot in front of them, or makes a slight tap on them, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of. Now you've instantly outcounted all the red rocks and made it not so easy for red to score a bundle here. Secondly, in club level play, this might even be a safer way to potentially set up a steal. It's not at all automatic that red's next rock will sit on your yellow, and if it doesn't, now you have a pretty reasonable rock to guard. Sure, it's behind the T-line, but red will have to make a good draw to outcount it, and even if they do, it's going to be difficult for them to set up a big end. You could also now draw one behind your guard and sit a second rock in the forefoot. If you make this shot, you're now sitting 1-2, and both rocks are at least somewhat difficult to get rid of. Sure, the red team still has a place to sit on to count one, but giving up one without the hammer is hardly a disaster. Another way to play more defensively without hitting is to generally make sure your guards are closer to the house as opposed to being higher guards. Now, for a lot of club level skips and players, this will seem just like good general curling advice. You've probably been taught that those free guards that land really, really close to the house are perfect world-class shots. Those higher guards are useful, but not as good, and the ones near the hog line are nothing more than a nuisance, and that sometimes you don't even want them over the hog line. In reality, all three of these rocks can be good, but for very different reasons. The rock near the hog line is best used to guard a second guard that's deeper. Usually you'll do that when you're far behind wanting to play aggressively. Splitting two guards by many feet makes it very difficult to double those rocks and improves your chances of hiding a rock behind them and successfully getting a steal or setting up a multiple with the hammer when you absolutely know you need to score. That rock that's in the two zone, about midway between the house and the hog line, is a fairly good rock to steal with or draw behind if you are only going to put one guard in play. Depending on how swinging the ice is, the exact spot you'd want that rock can vary, but the idea is that it's easy to draw around but not so easy to hit around. But what about that tight guard? Well, depending on your ice conditions, it may well still be possible to draw around it. However, more of the draws that come around this rock are likely to be at least partially open. If rocks are completely buried behind this guard, they're more likely to have to go a bit deeper. 
setting up rocks behind the house that you can then sit on in response. Even if someone does throw a great draw to the top of the house around that guard, you're now left with a short run back that maybe someone on your team can make, even if other players do struggle with hits. But even if you never draw around this guard, there are a number of things you can do with it that you wouldn't be able to do with a higher guard. For instance, maybe you can tap that guard into the house, making it a counter. Later in the end, you might even consider splitting it on to sit two rocks or to get a bonus point at the end of the end if you have the hammer. While all guards have their purpose, the tighter the guard is, the less aggressive of a play it is. These tight guards have the potential to be used defensively, even though they do have some offensive potential as well. After all, they are still guards. Finally, there's one last thing you can do when you don't really want to hit, but the situation calls for it. Just call a much lighter weight hit. Many people who aren't good at hitting really are saying they're not comfortable throwing up weight. But if a person has ever drawn through the house accidentally, chances are they can throw a hack weight hit, and even board weight hits are in the repertoire of most players who have been playing for more than a year or so. The great news is that a high percentage of hits can be made with these low weights. It really doesn't take much more than backline weight to remove one open rock from the house. Now that statement varies depending on how reactive your rocks are and how lively the ice is in your houses. But a direct nose hit at, say, hack weight will remove almost any rock from a house in most cases. And you probably really don't need to go above board weight for that direct hit to remove any rock at any club you're likely to play at. So when you run into circumstances where a hit is obviously the correct play, but your player or your team is just not that comfortable throwing the hit, consider just throwing it a little lighter than you normally would and seeing if that gets you the result you want. You might be surprised how well that works out. Honestly, throwing the lowest weight you need to accomplish a shot is usually the best idea anyway. If a hack weight hit gets the job done, throw hack weight. I hope these tips have given you some ideas of how you can play a little more defensively when you have a lead, even when you don't feel like your team hits very well. The good news is that you don't really have to change your strategy much at all when you're behind because you should play aggressively in any case in that situation. And when the game is close, it's perfectly okay to just say, hey, we're a drawing team and we're going to play more aggressively. The real adjustment comes when you have the lead, when you're going to want to play some level of defense, but that doesn't mean you have to play like you see the pros do it on TV. Chances are you're going to throw a hit from time to time, but there are a lot of ways to play defense without bringing out the peel weight. Thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel to show your support for Chess on Ice. I really appreciate all the kind messages I've gotten over the past couple weeks since I've started putting more content on this channel. And you can be sure I'll keep making videos as long as people keep enjoying them and telling me they want to see more. Thanks, and we'll see you again soon.